We heard the Apostle, Paul, Apostle John tell us this morning, if we walk in the light just as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Amen. My dear fellow saints, we were in the hospital room of my mother-in-law, Sue. The doctor had told us that she was dying. The, mono- the pneumonia had taken over. The whole family was there. My wife, Shelly, her dad, Jerry, her brother, Patrick, her sister, Becky, their spouses, and all of the grandchildren. And tears were streaming down everyone's cheeks. Being the pastor in the family, I led everyone in prayer and Scripture passages of resurrection comfort. After God had called Sue home to heaven, then we went to the funeral home. Jesus had already prepared a place in heaven for Sue, but now it was Jerry's turn to make sure everything was prepared for her Christian funeral. I remember sitting in the the office of the funeral home, and the funeral director asking the family about what he should write for the obituary. Jerry, Shelley, Becky, Patrick, none of them said anything. They were silent. They were in shock. They couldn't speak. Finally, I volunteered that I would write the obituary. I told him that I'm a pastor. I kind of write for a living. That shock and silence did not go away after the funeral was over. Sue was really big on decorating the entire house for Christmas. All Jerry does now is put up a lone, undecorated Christmas tree. Shelley will admit that it took her a very long time to get back to normal, to have her ambition and focus again. The grandchildren still terribly miss their grandmother. Almost every one of you has felt grief like this. Death has robbed you of someone close to you. No matter how long ago it was, the pain remains raw and fresh. A well-intentioned word can drive you to tears. A hymn can cause you to choke up. A picture can feel like a punch in the gut. A memory can feel like someone is clawing at your heart. You miss talking to your sibling because you are very close to him or her because you shared the same room growing up. You lost your mom, whom you used to pour your heart out to. You miss doing projects with your dad. You grieve the death of your child because there's not much worse in our world than having to bury your own child. You miss the smile the smell, the soft snoring next to you in bed because you shared that bed for decades with your spouse. Satan loves all this. Satan loves to use his ally of death to bring turmoil into your life. Satan uses grief to rob you of the peace that Christ's resurrection brings. He wants your eyes to be so filled with tears that you cannot see the open and empty tomb in front of you. He wants your mind to be so clouded that you do not notice the dead Christ defeating death for you. He enjoys seeing you so overwrought with sorrow over what you have lost that you cannot begin to think about what Jesus has gained for you and your Christian loved one. Satan needs for you to be angry. He wants you to be enraged at God so that you keep on questioning God in your anger. Your anger leads you to question how God can call himself loving because it doesn't seem very loving for him to take your child away from you. It gets you to question about how God can really be caring. Because if he really cared, he let you hang out with your sibling for a lot longer. That how can God be merciful when he did not heal your spouse of the disease or wake up your parents from their sleep? And Satan craves for you to feel guilty, to keep on questioning yourself after the death of your loved one. What could you have done differently? 
how could you have said that in anger or frustration and that being the last thing that your loved one heard before they died? That you learn the hard way that there's always going to be another meeting and there's never going to be more time that you can spend at the dinner table talking or out in the backyard playing catch or another time to be able to say, I love you. This grief, anger, and guilt can wreck your marriage. They can destroy your relationship with your family and friends. They can create a wedge between you and your Christian brothers and sisters. They can drive you away from your faith in God being a merciful Heavenly Father. And Satan delights in all of this. Satan wants you to dwell in the darkness. That's why it's important to remember the words of St. John in our epistle lesson today. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we walk in the light just as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. When you are feeling the darkness of death threatening to overwhelm you, Remember that Jesus Christ was born in the darkness as the light of the world. That he, in unnatural darkness, died so that he could then bring light and salvation into the world. That as light was beginning to dawn on Easter Sunday morning, Jesus Christ was alive and he walked out of the darkness of the tomb. The light of Jesus shines into the darkness of death and the devil. After Jesus' death, his disciples were filled with doubt, fear, and confusion. After your loved one dies, you are filled with doubt, fear, and confusion. Christ's resurrection from the grave changes everything. Faith replaces doubt. Trust replaces fear. Confidence replaces confusion. All because the Son of God is now alive. And because He lives, you too will live. You need to hear this again and again. The disciples needed to hear it again and again. They needed to hear it at least one more time. And that's exactly why Jesus was in the locked room on Easter evening as the disciples were there because they were afraid of the Jews. You imagine that they were discussing the testimony of the women and Mary Magdalene, Peter, and the Emmaus disciples because they had seen the risen Christ. They must have been talking about their guilt, about how they had abandoned and deserted Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. They must have felt grief because their rabbi and their master was dead. They were feeling confusion about how God could allow such a brutal death upon his only son. Amid all of this fear, confusion, and guilt... Jesus is standing among them, and then he gives them the words that they need to hear at that moment. Peace be with you. That peace gives them a solid foundation to stand upon before the judgment seat of God on the last day. That peace of God, that the crucified Christ has now become the atoning sacrifice for their sins and for the sins of the whole world. That death and resurrection of God's Son had always been part of God's plan from the very beginning. Jesus says, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Luke explains, Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And I imagine Jesus sitting down with them and doing a Bible study with them, opening up the Old Testament passages about his suffering and death. He could have reminded them of Psalm 22, where David wrote about Jesus' crucifixion with these words. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them. 
for my clothing they cast lots. Or then going on to Isaiah's prophecy of the suffering servant. We thought it was because of God that he was stricken, smitten, and afflicted. But it was because of our rebellion that he was pierced. He was crushed for the guilt our sins deserved. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds we are healed. Then Jesus could have continued that Bible study by pointing them to Psalm 16 that prophesied his resurrection. You will not let your favored one see decay. Again, he could have gone back to Psalm 22 where the suffering Savior prays for deliverance from the lion's mouth, which is a metaphor for Satan. This prayer is followed by a hymn of praise from the Messiah. He is praising God for his deliverance. Save me from the mouth of the lion, from the horns of the wild oxen. You have answered me. I will declare your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. After the Bible study is over, then Jesus shows them the wounds in his hands and his feet. Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. Because a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. These marks are the certainty of the passion of the resurrection. These marks of the passion are the certainty of the resurrection of the flesh on the last day. And after Jesus' disciples received this peace, then Jesus wanted them to share this peace with others. He says to them, you are witnesses of these things. And fellow saints, after you have received these words of peace from Jesus, Jesus wants you to tell others about this peace too. He says to you, you are witnesses of these things too. It doesn't matter your age. You can lead people who are hurting, grieving, broken in a Bible study. For the parents who are grieving the death of their infant in her baptismal grace, you can remind them that their daughter has been spared this world's evils by pointing them to Isaiah 57, verse 1. No one understands that the righteous one is being spared from evil. For the believing child who died in his sleep after a long bout with childhood leukemia, you can remind his parents that though their son fell asleep in his hospital room, he woke up in his own room in the mansions of heaven. For Jesus says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going to prepare a place for you. For the friend who is grieving the death of their sibling, you can remind him that his Christian sibling has been gathered to God's people. It was said of them the same way it was said of Abraham and Ishmael. When he breathed his last and died, he was gathered to his people. For the friend whose spouse has died and misses him or her terribly, you can remind your friend that their Christian spouse is right now seated at the banquet feast of Christ. You can read all of Psalm 23 with them and then focus on this verse. You set a table for me in the presence of my enemies. For the family who watched their spouse suffer with dementia or struggle with cancer, you can remind the family that their believing parent is, has now departed and is at peace. And we pray for that peace too. Along with Simeon, Lord, you now dismiss your servant in peace. Satan wants to use your guilt and your grief to drive you away from God. He wants to use those things to drive a wedge between you and your Heavenly Father. Your Heavenly Father wants to use your grief to draw you closer to Him, to receive resurrection comfort. He wants to use His Word to remove your guilt and replace it with the precious words of His forgiveness. He wants to use His Word to calm your anger at Him and teach you that everything He does is for the benefit of you and your Christian loved ones. You may not understand this now, but by the grace of God, your Christian loved one is understanding and appreciating that eternal benefit right now. 
And this is the peace that the resurrected Christ gives to you. He is with, with you. He is talking to you, showing you the wounds of his passion, bringing you this much-needed resurrection comfort. He does this during the season of Easter. He does this in the hospital room. He does this at the cemetery. Jesus says, peace be with you. Amen. Please rise. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will, keep, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.